Presented by Caltech. I'd like to introduce Kira Ordner. Kira is currently a junior majoring in chemistry. She's done two SURFs, and this past summer she worked with Dr. Sarah Reisman. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kira Ordner. Last summer, I worked with Professor Sarah Reisman and graduate student Julie Hofstra. We worked on designing a new reaction to take these chiral allosilanes and transform them into chiral tetrahydropyrans via a tandem allylation cyclization reaction. In this talk, I'll start off by giving you guys some background in organic chemistry and talk about the importance of chirality in molecules. I'll then talk about the importance of heterocycles in medicine and talk about how we were able to develop this new reaction to develop these heterocyclic motifs. I'll conclude with some future directions. The Reisman group is concerned with the total synthesis of natural products. A natural product is any chemical compound isolated from nature. Uh, so here are some examples of natural products that we've worked with in the lab. And what's interesting about these natural products is a lot of them have bioactive properties, so we can use them in medicine. But when we isolate them in nature, like from fruits, plants, even sea slugs, they're in very trace amounts. So it's the job of the organic chemist to devise a way to synthesize these molecules in the lab. There are two sides to total synthesis, the synthesis of the molecule itself, and that's the stepwise construction of the molecule, kind of like building a puzzle. Each step, you're adding more complexity, building a more complex puzzle piece. And in order to get to those desired intermediate puzzle pieces, we can use reactions that were developed in the literature before, but oftentimes we have to develop the reaction ourselves. One of the current projects on reaction development in the Reisman group is nickel catalyzed cross coupling reactions. Here you can see the puzzle pieces coming together. We take vinyl bromides and silo substituted benzyl chlorides and afford chiral allosilane materials. Here are some examples of chiral allosilanes that we have developed using this reaction. In order to understand why we make these molecules in a chiral form, we must first understand what chirality actually is. Chirality means that a molecule has a non-superimposable mirror image. And that's what we can call the handedness of the molecule. Uh, take your left and your right hand, for example. If you put a mirror plane between them, they're perfect mirror images. But no matter how you try to orient them, they'll never perfectly overlap. So here's an example of chiral molecules on the board. Uh, as you can see, there's an imaginary mirror plane between them. They're perfect mirror images. But due to the three-dimensionality of the molecule, they'll never perfectly overlap. A good rule of thumb to look for a chiral atom is to look for an atom that has four different substituents on it. We represent the three-dimensionality of the molecule using wedges and dashes. A wedge, like here, represents a group coming out of the plane of the board, and a dash represents a group going into the plane of the board. And for convention, we don't, don't draw hydrogens, so you can imagine there's a dashed hydrogen coming off of this chiral carbon here. Chiral molecules are found all throughout nature, even in our bodies. Uh, these two molecules right here are actually amino acids. But more importantly, chirality can vi vary biological activity. In the 1960s, there was a drug on the market called thalidomide. It was marketed to pregnant women to combat anti-morning sickness. Um, unfortunately, only one enantiomer had the desired therapeutic effect, and the opposite enantiomer, so here you have the group coming out of the plane of the board and the group going into the plane of the board, this enantiomer caused severe birth defects in the children. So um, you can understand now why we want to make these molecules in a chiral form. And there are other chiral bioactive natural products on the market today. You may have heard of erythromycin, an antibiotic, uh, morphine, a pain medication. And you can see all of those chiral centers with the wedges and the dashes. But more importantly, there's a pattern emerging as we look at these molecules. There's a lot of heterocyclic motifs that I have highlighted in blue for you. A heterocycle is any carbon ring that has a non-carbon atom in it. So here we have nitrogen and oxygen incorporation into these rings. Heterocycles are notoriously difficult to synthesize in the lab. So we thought we could find a way to take that cross-coupling reaction that I mentioned previously and transform <coughs> chiral allosilanes into chiral tetrahydropyrans. In order to do that, we believed that we could use a tandem allylation cyclization reaction. So here we have the allylation step in which the chiral allosilane reacts with an aldehyde, <coughs> forming a carbon-carbon bond. The chiral information from this carbon is transferred to the adjacent carbon atom. 
And then the pendant chloride electrophile is kicked off when the oxygen uh, forms the cyclic structure. There's good precedent in the, in the literature for both of these steps. Uh, the first step is a saccharide allylation, which has been known to take chiral allosilanes to chiral alcohol products. And the same alcohol motif with the pendant electrophile has been known to undergo SN2 cyclization reactions. So we looked at the first step. Now the saccharide allylation is initiated by using a Lewis acid. Uh, there are two very common Lewis acids used in the lab, uh, BF3 etherate and titanium tetrachloride. And we decided to ex uh, expose our allosilane material to both of these Lewis acids. BF3 etherate um, consumed all of the starting material, but we got no, no cyclic products from this uh, Lewis acid, um, and we didn't even get the predicted alcohol intermediate. Uh, so then we moved on to titanium tetrachloride. Again, all of the starting material was consumed, so a reaction was occurring. Um, unfortunately, only trace cyclization occurred, and the major product was actually the alcohol product. So we decided to move forward and see if we could quantify these yields, and in order to do that, we had to isolate each of these products. We used a technique called proton NMR spectroscopy to characterize these molecules. This technique gives us the fingerprint of the molecule, if you will. Here, we have the chiral allosilane starting material, and when it is transformed into the alcohol intermediate in the allylation step, the double bond shifts in position. And likewise, these uh, signals change. When the alcohol cyclizes to the tetrahydropyran, the signal in this region changes. Now that we had isolated and characterized each of these compounds, we were able to develop a GC assay. This allowed us to easily quantify our reaction yields. So we redid that reaction with the titanium tetrachloride as our Lewis acid. Um, we found out that we had only 2% yield of the desired tetrahydropyran and 69% yield of the alcohol intermediate. We had two hypotheses for why cyclization was not occurring. The first was that the titanium in the Lewis acid was coordinating too strongly to the oxygen in the alkoxide intermediate. Alternatively, we believed that the alkoxide was actually protonating too quickly and forming the alcohol, and therefore cyclization could not occur. We decided to test a variety of additives to see which of these hypotheses was correct. We started off with a crown ether, benzo 15 crown 5, which has been known to coordinate ti to titanium. So here you can see that the, oxygen, uh, the crown ether is uh, coordinated to the titanium and the Lewis acid. And we believe that by coordinating it here, we would weaken this titanium oxygen bond. And then we would allow for cyclization to occur. Unfortunately, this was not correct. We only got 1% yield of the desired product. So we moved on to the deprotonation theory. Here we started off with a mild base, 2,6-lutidine, and again believe that we could pluck off this proton and allow for the cyclic product to form. Again, only saw 2% yield. We moved forward with an even stronger base, potassium t-butoxide, and thought that this t-butoxide group could again pluck off the proton and allow for cyclization to occur. With one and two equivalents of the strong base, we only saw 2% yield of the tetrahydropyran. However, when we increased the equivalents to 5 and even 10, our yield increased dramatically to 69% and 79% yield. And while you could think of this as a deprotonation problem, we believe that with our proposed mechanism, it is actually a coordination issue. A mechanism is a stepwise explanation for what we think is happening in the reaction. So here we have the Lewis acid coordinating and activating that aldehyde. And the carbon-carbon bond forms between the chiral allosilane and the aldehyde. Again, that chiral information is transferred to the adjacent carbon atom. The chloride plucks off the TMS group. And here we get to our intermediate. The Lewis acid is coordinated to the alkoxide. At this point, we add the base. The first equivalent displaces the chloride ion. And again, that happens sequentially with each equivalent of the base until we have all chlorides displaced by alkoxide groups. At this point, the fourth equivalent of t-butoxide uh, kicks off the titanium, and, and since this titanium oxygen bond is sufficiently weak. Again, this point, we allow for cyclization to occur and get to our desired product. At this point, we had a successful reaction, but we wanted to see if we could further optimize it and increase our yield. In order to do that, we looked at the gas chromatograph traces. Um, here, each peak represents an individual product that's being formed. Um, 
and they, using the gas chromatograph, the peaks have different times representing different side products forming. Um, here, our major product of the allylation step is the alcohol product, and here, we, when we add the base, we get the tetrahydropyran product. Dodecane was the standard for each case. The smaller peaks are those side products, and when your starting material is consumed and transformed into other materials other than your desired product, your yield obviously decreases. So we were able to isolate one of our major side products, the one at 7.4 minutes right here, and found that it was happening through an elimination pathway. The chloride was kicking off the TMS group and uh, forming the double-double bond here. And at this point, we believed that there just wasn't enough of the aldehyde in solution. Um, in order to combat this, we decided to increase the amount of aldehyde. Uh, so we started with 1.5 equivalents in the initial reaction and increased it for to 1.8 equivalents. Uh, this was successful. Our yield increased from 69% to 74% yield. Uh, so at this point, we have a successful stoichiometric method. This means that we have a one-to-one -one ratio of our Lewis acid to our starting material, but we'd like to eventually make this reaction catalytic. This is a much more economic way for the reaction to proceed. We're using less material, producing less waste, and we have a variety of Lewis acids that we would like to try in the near future. Additionally, for the entirety of this GC assay, we used propene aldehyde as the aldehyde. Um, but we'd like to see if we can handle more sterically demanding R groups, uh, for example, benzaldehyde. Uh, we'd also like to see how much variance we can get in this R group, because the more uh, R groups we can have here, we can have a variety of different header cycles. And if you remember from the beginning of the talk, you, there's a variety of different uh, motifs that are used in natural products that are on the market as medicines. So we really want to make this reaction useful to add to the chemist's toolbox. Finally, we would like to see if we can make this reaction work with a variety of related heterocycles. Again, oxygen was not the only heteroatom in those uh, heterocycles in the products. Uh, we had also nitrogen and believed that we could use an imine to uh, do the allylation step. And we would also like to vary the chain length of the chiral allosilane to get five-membered rings instead of six-membered rings, and additionally, eventually like to add some functionality. Again, we just really want to make this reaction as useful as possible for chemists to create those bioactive natural products. I'd like to thank Professor Sarah Reisman for mentoring me this summer and for the past two years, uh, the Richard H. Cox Surf Fellowship for funding me this summer, Julie for being a great grad student and helping me all summer, the surf program <laughs> for uh, providing me with this opportunity, and you guys for listening. So thank you very much. Up in the floor to any questions. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I, I have two questions. So, okay. um, the first question is why doesn't your TB toxide just knock out the chloride directly? So, you're right, you're showing, you're proposing that your TB toxide would be protonate the other alcohol and then you would have so molecular. Like, why wouldn't the TB toxide just right here, like doing yeah. like this? Um, it's because we think that that. Uh, coordination between the Lewis acid and the oxygen is just too strong and so we can't just immediately kick off the Lewis acid that uh, by adding on these large uh, electron withdrawing groups we're sufficiently weakening that bond. And then did you guys ever try to pep up the, your leaving group there instead of use a different leaving group than chloride? Um, we tested a, a catalytic Lewis acid uh, titanium uh, the, hold on, English. <laughs> Titanium isoperboxide with these larger alkoxide groups, and we thought that if we already had bulky alkoxide groups on it, that um, it would be easier to displace. Um, but we only saw 5% conversion, and for the non chemists, that means only 5% of our starting material actually reacted. I think so. she was asking about the instead of your leaving group, Kira. Yeah. Did you try any vinyl? Did you try any alcylanes that have different leaving groups? Oh, the electrophiles. Yeah. Do you mean here? I was asking, I guess the chloride here. is getting knocked. Yeah, that yes. Way. We started off the reaction. Here we go. <laughs> here we go. Um, with uh, this tosyl group right here. Um, but, sorry for all the clicking. It takes several steps to get to that product. It's a one, two, three, four step procedure. Um, when we used chloride, it was one step. And so, for the purposes of just like testing as much as possible, we just. Used efficient, yeah. 
Other questions? Thank you, Kira.